जय राधा माधवा कुंजवी हरी जय राम जय राम माधवा कुंजवी हरी जय गोपी जनवल्लभ गिरीवर्धा जय जय गोपी जय गोपी जनवल्लभ गिरीवर्धा जय जय गोपी सौरनंदन भजन जसौरनंदन भजन जमून थीर भान छिया जमून थीर भान छिया Okay, so people are online now. Yeah. Yes. Okay, as long as they can get online. Okay, Bhagavad Gita, chapter ten, text number fifteen, the opulence of the absolute. Om namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Swayam evatmanam evatmanam 
Swayamivatmanam Natmanam Veta Twam Purushotama Bhuta Bhavana Bhutesa Deva Deva Jagatpate Swayamivatmanatmanam Veta Twam Purushotama Bhuta Bhavana Bhutesa Deva Deva Jagatpate Swayam Evatmanatmanam Veta Twam Purushotamam Bhuta Bhavena Bhutesa Deva Deva Jagatpate Swayam, personally, Eva, certainly, Atmana, by yourself, Atmanam, yourself, Veta, no, Tvam, Purusha Uttama, O greatest of all persons, Bhuta Bhavana, O orig origin of everything, Bhuta Isha, O Lord of everything, Deva Deva, O Lord of all demigods, Jagat Pate, O Lord of the universe. Translation. <clears throat> this is Arjuna speaking. Indeed, you alone know yourself by your own internal potency, O Supreme Person, origin of all, Lord of all beings, God of gods, Lord of the universe. Hmm. Please repeat. Indeed, you alone know yourself by your own internal potency, O Supreme Person, origin of all. Lord of all beings, God of gods, Lord of the universe. Srila Prabhupada's purport, the Supreme Lord Krishna can be known by persons who are in the relationship with him through the discharge of devotional service, like Arjuna and his followers. Persons of demoniac or atheistic mentality cannot know Krishna. Mental speculation that leads one away from the Supreme Lord is a serious sin, and one who does not know Krishna should not try to comment on the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is the statement of Krishna, and since it is the science of Krishna, it should be understood from Krishna as Arjuna understood it. It should not be received from atheistic persons. As, as stated in the Srimad Bhagavatam 1.2.11, Vadanti tat tatvam vidvam tatvam yaj jnanam avayam brahmeti paramatmetim bhagavan iti sabdhyate. The supreme truth is realized in three aspects as impersonal Brahman, localized Paramatma, and at last the supreme personality of Godhead. So at the last stage of understanding the absolute truth, one comes to the supreme personality of Godhead. A common man or even a liberated man who has realized impersonal Brahman or localized Paramatma 
may not understand God's personality. Such men, therefore, may endeavor to understand the Supreme Person from the verses of Bhagavad Gita, which are being spoken by this person, Krishna. Sometimes the impersonalists accept Krishna as Bhagavan, or they accept his authority. Yet many liberated persons cannot understand Krishna as Purushottam, the Supreme Person. Therefore, Arjuna addresses him as Purushottama. Yet one still may not understand that Krishna is the father of all living entities. Therefore, Arjuna addresses him as Bhuta Bhavana. And if one comes to know him as father of all living entities, still one may not know him as the supreme controller. Therefore, he is addressed here as Bhuta Sa, the supreme controller of everyone. And if even one knows Krishna as the supreme controller of all living entities, still one may not know that he is the origin of all the demigods. Therefore, he is addressed as Deva Deva, the worshipful god of all demigods. And even if one knows him as the worshipful god of all demigods, one may not know him that he is the supreme proprietor of everything. Therefore, he is addressed as Jagat Pati. Thus, the truth about Krishna is established in this verse by the realization of Arjuna, and we should follow in the footsteps of Arjuna to understand Krishna as he is. Hmm. Umagyan timidandasya gena jena salakaya chaksu un militam yena tas mai shri gurvena maha nama om vishnu padaya krishna prasthaya bhutale shri makti bhakti vedanta swami tinamine namaste saraswati deve gaudavani bhajarine nirvishesa sunyavari pasyat yade sadarine Panchakalpa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu Bhavacha Patita Nam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasari Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare in this series of verses, starting with verses number 12 and 13, and continuing on, Arjuna wants to make it clear to the world that Krishna is the supreme source of all existence. He is the God of God. He is the God of the demigods. He is the father of all living beings. He is the supreme controller of everything that exists. <laughs> Many people who read Bhagavad Gita <laughs> have come up with uh, their own, what we say, screwed up ideas of who Krishna is <laughs> by putting him into different categories <clears throat> because they, the reason why is because Krishna is the speaker of the Bhagavad Gita. And what he says, if you accept him as the supreme authority, then you have to accept him as what he, for what he says. But if you relegate him to a different position, then you can choose whether to accept, to accept or not. <laughs> and that's the point why a lot of commentators, so-called spiritualists, Mayavadis and others, like to put Krishna in different categories in, in order for their to fulfill their own desires and yet same, at the same time practice some form of spiritual uh, activity. But here Arjuna wants to take the trouble, and he does, and he does it very thoroughly, to make sure that Krishna position is understood clearly by everyone. So when you want to really make a point on a certain topic, you emphasize it, you, s you repeat it, and you say the same thing from different angles of vision, just to make sure that the point is well understood and accepted. And in the uh, 12th and 13th verse, Krishna, he says, Param Brahma, Param Dharma, Pavitram, Vidam, Mamam, 
that uh, you are the supreme God, the supreme controller, and the source of everything, the original, personal. Everyone says that, including great sages such as Devala, Sita, Narada, and Vyas. Now you yourself are declaring it unto me. So in that verse, which is the verse that leads this whole series of verses about establishing Krishna's position, it becomes clear that Krishna is the speaker of the Bhagavad Gita and he is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, the authority of his words are absolute and they cannot be challenged. And that is the important point. That way we accept Bhagavad Gita not as some idea or some nice spiritual philosophical uh, precept, but we accept it as the absolute principle coming from the absolute truth himself, who is a person. Even Srila Prabhupada would question his devotees to see how much they had actually accepted Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Not everybody, because in the Western world people didn't have any conception, basically, or maybe a few misconceptions about Indian spirituality. And when Prabhupada came, he cleared the way by explaining what was not the truth, but also emphasizing what is the truth from different angles of vision in order for people to get a clear understanding of that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And the Shastras explain Ishwar Parma Krishna, Satchit, Ananda, Vigraha, Anadir, Adir, Govinde, Govinda, Sarva Karna, Karnam. Ahamadi Devanam, Krishna says also in this same chapter in the very beginning, Aham Sarvasya Prabhupada, I am the source of everything material and spiritual. So this is a very essential point to know that the speaker of the Bhagavad Gita is the source of everything and the knowledge coming from Bhagavad Gita is perfect and absolute and it applies in all times and circumstance. It's not that Bhagavad Gita was relevant when it was spoken and now it's no longer relevant or we need something new, we need something different, we need to, to change. I remember I was riding on the airplane and I was traveling in India and uh, I had to sit to next to very two nice gentlemen. I was sitting by the window and there was one gentleman sitting next to me and another gentleman sitting next to him. And the three of us kind of got to know each other of course, I'm always dressed in my, you know, spiritual clothes. And so, one man, he was very entrepreneur. He, uh, he had established a very successful business, and he was friendly in that way. His business was somewhat sattvic. The other man was even more spiritual. He was the one that was sitting next to me. And he took an interest, <clears throat> and he started asking me many questions about Krishna consciousness. And then through our discussion, he mentioned that he was also a follower of a particular spiritual teacher who worships Lord Shiva. <laughs> and he also said that his guru uh, has presented the Bhagavad Gita in such a way that it becomes the teachings of Lord Shiva. <laughs> In other words, taking Krishna's words and interjecting Shiva with different ideas. And he had the book, he had an extra copy of the book with me, with him. And he was eager to give it to me to read. And so I wasn't so eager to take it. <laughs> and then, of course, he was so nice and friendly. And in that kind of environment, you become susceptible to a person's, you know, good nature, good will. But uh, I kept praying to Krishna that I can't do it. I can't agree to read this Gita. 
Because if I say I'm going to read it, and I take it, and I don't read it, then I'm not being truthful. So I decided not to go that route, and I decided, well, I'll just try to very nicely refuse. And I did, saying that um, I don't think I really have to hear more about the Gita because I have my own complete understanding of Krishna's words in the Gita. And being a very gentleman, as he was, he accepted it <laughs> and didn't push the Gita on me. But then again, I came across another incident where another version of the Gita has been given. And as Prabhupada said, and this was in this was in 1970s, he said 666 editions of the Bhagavad Gita have been written. Now it's over 700 different types of Bhagavad Gita, commentaries, critiques. Um, I remember when I was in, uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio, I was uh, involved with a preaching center there. And um, I was getting these magazines about spirituality from one source. I can't remember the source today. But they had different topics on spirituality, and I got interested in reading some of them. So there was one a huge, long article, really long, took up most of the magazine on the Bhagavad Gita. And in this article, the uh, author was a professor from a university in America. And he very nicely and with great poetry described the Bhagavad Gita. But nowhere in the description was Krishna mentioned as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Nowhere in the whole description. So I'm thinking, hmm, this man has written something very poetic, very nicely composed, very interesting to read, but no mention of Krishna. So I thought, I should contact the author and maybe enlighten him a little bit about Krishna. <laughs> so I did. I decided I didn't. I found his name and then I found out what university he was a professor at. Uh, I was lucky enough to get his phone number, his office number. And in those days, we didn't. That was in the seven. That was in the eighties. We didn't have <laughs> email. <laughs> There wasn't no, there wasn't no cell phones. There wasn't no emails in those days. So it was just you know you put your money in the phone and you dial, <laughs> or you have your own private phone at home. So uh, I decided to go and make the phone call. So I found his number, and dialed, and then he got on the phone and I introduced myself and then I was explaining how. I really appreciated his article on on the Bhagavad Gita, but then at one point I decided to explain that, well, but you missed one thing, my dear professor. You forgot to mention that Krishna is the, the speaker of the Bhagavad Gita and he is the Supreme Lord himself. And then he said, well then, who are you? What group are you with? And so I, I said, I'm with the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. He said, oh, yes, the Hare Krishnas. He said, thank you very much for calling. I appreciate it. And then he hung up. <laughs> so he wasn't interested in hearing anything else. <laughs> so this, is, this goes on in the name of literary expertise, poetry, academia, spirituality, and no one gives credit to where the credit belongs, and that Krishna is not only the speaker of the Bhagavad Gita, but he is the sarvakarnakarnam, he's the cause of all causes, the absolute principle. So you find, and Prabhupada quotes from the Srimad Bhagavatam verse, Vedanti tat tat vad vidam vidas, Tadvat yajjnanam avayam brahmeti paravatmeti bhagavaniti sabjate. That Krishna is the last word in the absolute truth. The absolute truth contains three aspects of itself. 
The jnanis worship Brahman, the yogis worship Paramatma, and the devotees, they worship Bhagavan. But in jnana marg and in yoga marg, mostly all yoga margs, there's no process of surrendering to the Lord. It's only when you get to Bhagavan that you understand that he is a person and you are his servant. And the process for practicing personal yoga or supreme personality is to surrender to the instructions of the supreme person and follow them in order to practice spiritual life. <laughs> The yogis don't do that. They simply worship the, the, the Paramatma within the heart. And they have their own ideas on the nature of Paramatma and how Paramatma is everywhere within the hearts of all living entities. They have some Shakti, they have some power. But their devotion is really centered around themselves as being very materially adept at controlling the material energy. Yogis are mostly mystics, where they can use power in order to control. The jnanis, they're mostly interested in getting out of the entanglement of material suffering. And so they worship the Supreme Brahman, who uh, they, through different forms of meditation, prayer, and various types of austerities, which they find in the scriptures, and of course they also develop themselves. They also get some realization of the supreme, the, the absolute truth as being uh, all pervading and the source of everything, but they have no connection with the personality of Godhead. And as mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the first canto, that unless one worships or one develops relationship with a person, one cannot what we say, practice uh, real spirituality because personal relationships are natural. We see that in this world. People connect with each other on different levels or through different mm, responsibilities, family responsibilities, social response, friendly responsibilities. In other words, people are connected with each other in different ways. And so relationships with others are important. So Prabhupada writes in that first verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, he says that unless one develops the personal relationship with the Supreme Lord, they will actually go back to engaging in material sense gratification. Because personal relationships are foundational to happiness and unless people find it in God, they will look for it in the material world, <laughs> in, in some material sense. So therefore, unless we understand Krishna is a person, and when you talk about qualities, you talk about a person. You talk about activities, you talk about a person. You talk about... Uh, uh, Energies, you have to talk about the source of those energies. So ultimately, the absolute truth is the supreme person. And then, then you, the next question is, who is that supreme person? And then the Shastras explain that it is, his name is Krishna. And they apply the principle that the supreme person being the source of everything is also the source of all attraction. Therefore, the word Krishna means who he who attracts everyone. He who attracts everyone. So Prabhupada very nicely delineates step by step the meaning from one stage to another because as Arjuna is glorifying the Lord, he's going from the high from one stage of glorification to another, ending up with that ultimately Krishna is Jagatpati. He is the supreme proprietor of everything. And when you say proprietor, that also de denotes controller. Because when you have proprietor, there is someone who is controlling that propriety. 
So he is both the proprietor and the controller, and because he it own, he, is, own, he owns it and is controlled by him, he is also the supreme enjoyer. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Bhoktaram yagya tapasam sarvaloka maheshwaram suhidam sarvadbhutanam shantam yan mam shantam rich jati that I am the source of all spiritual material worlds. Uh, I am the supreme proprietor and I am also bhokta. I am the supreme enjoyer. And I am the dehinam sarva bhutanam sarva dehinam. I am the friend of all living entities. <laughs> so you'll find throughout this Gita many, many verses that emphasize Krishna's position as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Because after establishing that throughout the Gita, at the end, in the last chapter, Krishna says, now you know everything, then Sarva Dharma Pariksha Then you have to surrender. In other words, you have to engage in devotional activities to that Supreme Personality of Godhead. Because without establishing his position, not only by himself, but we see it's done through Arjuna. And Arjuna quotes other authorities just to make his point clear. Narada, Sita, Devala, the author of the Vedas, Vyasadeva himself, all of these persons say, you are that person who is the source of all existence. You said it, I'm saying it, these people say it. And so, in order to establish Krishna's position, because people will find reasons, and they'll look for them, to find reasons that Krishna is not the Supreme Lord. <laughs> and therefore, they don't have to surrender. <laughs> That's the whole point. <laughs> yeah. The point is to somehow practice spirituality and still and still maintain material desires. And that's why people don't want to surrender to Krishna. Because they may talk nicely about Krishna. You know, even, see, even, even see when we preach in Krishna consciousness here, we invite people to come. And they like it. They could take prasadam. They take part in the process. But then when it comes to surrendering more engaging in devotional service, giving up certain material attachments, uh, performing some activities that may be difficult to perform but are necessary, then people think, well, maybe I'll try some other place. <laughs> you know, I, I learned something anyway. Maybe I'll go learn something somewhere else. They're not ready f for that progressive march towards the and that's how Krishna sets it up through the spiritual master. He gradually moves the candidate from one stage to another, one step to another, until one gets to the point of full surrender. But he makes the point that full surrender is the goal in order to become, what we say, enlightened in self-realization. To understand Krishna means to understand the self because he is called the self of all selves. He is the source of everything and he is the source of all living entities. As is mentioned here, he is Sarvadehinam, or he is, he is the friend and the source of all living beings. <laughs> uh, what is that verse? Oh yeah. Aham Bida. Aham pita adam bija. Aham pita adam aham bija. Uh, I know the verse. It's in chapter number 14, verse number 4. Let's see here what Krishna says. 14, 4, he says, yeah, he says, Sarva yoni shukonteya Murtaya sambhavanti yaha tasman brahman maha yonir aham bija prada pita. It should be understood that all species of life, O son of Kunti, are made possible by birth 
in this material nature and that I am the seed giving father. Krishna says, I am that seed that gives life to all life. So knowing that, there's nothing else to do but to worship Krishna in the mood of surrendering to Krishna in devotion. So that's why there's so much emphasis. And before we can actually start to really go deeper into the philosophy of Krishna consciousness, we need to understand Krishna's position. That he is the absolute principle of all existence. Um, he is both the energy and the source of the energy. Uh, he is inside and every, outside everything. Prabhupada was talking, I was listening yesterday. But he was using a particular Sanskrit terminology that Krishna, you know, he is inside, he is outside. He is both simultaneously inside and outside. And he said we should try to understand Krishna in both levels, both on the within the existence and within the heart of all living entities, like that. So he is ultimately everything and everywhere, and ultimately the supreme controller. That's the most important point. He controls everything. Prabhupada would always give that that statement that a man is sick and he's quite ill and he goes to the doctor. Can the doctor cure that man? Well, that depends. That doctor may be expert in the science of medicine and he have, may have had many successes in the past. But if Krishna says, no, this person is not to be cured, the doctor can't do anything. And if Krishna says, and even if a person doesn't have a doctor, that person can be cured if Krishna says he should be cured. I have a personal story, not personal, but it, it, it came to me that one devotee, and he was an inmate in one jail in America, and newly connected to Krishna consciousness through devotees writing letters and receiving Prabhupada's books, he was chanting. So the virus, COVID virus came into the jail, many people were getting sick, uh, but the jail authorities were ignoring the people, they weren't giving them any treatment at all, zero. <laughs> so some were dying. But this boy, who had some connection, he decided to just chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra continuously quite sick, and he just was chanting, chanting, chanting. And at the same time, he writes, he wrote a letter explaining his situation. He was also praying while he was chanting, along with chanting. And uh, after a few days, maybe a week or more, he was completely cured. <laughs> he was completely cured. No medicine, no treatment, no care, simply the holy name, that was all. <laughs> Interesting story. And so we see, you know, if Krishna wants to show his mercy, and he did in this case because the boy was sincerely chanting the holy name from the core of his heart. He had no choice. He had no medicine. He had no help. He had nothing. He turned to Krishna wholeheartedly and with complete dependence on the Lord's mercy. He was just praying and chanting. And uh, after some time, all the symptoms of disease were gone. So we see, you know, how Krishna is ultimately there within everything. He says about medicine, he says, I am the healing herb. <laughs> so medicines are made out of herbs, which are taken from nature. You know, so they add their own chemicals to these herbs. But the, in, Veda, in Ayurveda, they don't mess around with chemicals. They just take the herbs and process the herbs through maybe a few, t a few types of tinctures, but and then they give it to you. So the herb, Krishna says, I am the healing herb. <laughs> so Krishna is everything. This whole chapter, this is the beginning of this whole series of verses. Actually, it starts on verse number... Uh, 
In verse number 20, Krishna goes on through the entire chapter comparing himself to the greatest in all categories of existence. And then this chapter helps us understand more that Krishna was in everything. Prabhupada was talking, you know, you listen to Prabhupada, you get a lot of interesting points. Prabhupada was saying, you know, the drunkards, who they drink wine, they drink their liquor, if they just think this, is, this taste is Krishna, after some time they will become devotees. <laughs> yeah. He said, if they think, oh, this taste is liquor, this is Krishna, and then after some time they'll be a devotee of Krishna. So, yeah, this is how Krishna is, within everything and without everything. And he is ultimately <clears throat> Suhidam Sarvadehinam, the best friend of all living entities. And for a devotee, devotees can understand that Krishna is every, the best friend. Always, as a friend helps another friend, Krishna is always helping the devotees in their struggle to become Krishna conscious. And to become free from the effects of material energy. Okay, so I'll stop here and see if there's any questions or comments. Avaduta Raya Dasa asking uh, Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. I am a bit discouraged after reading what means Krishna consciousness. It means to know six tattvas as per Chaitanya Charitamrita. Krishna tattva, Bhakti tattva, Prema tattva, Sara, Bhava tattva, Rasa tattva, Lila tattva, Ara. What do you think? Take them one at a time, yeah. <laughs> Rasa taught for you to take at the end. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's not that each of the tattvas are exclusive. They're categorized in different ways, but in bhakti tattva there is rasa tattva, there is krishna tattva, there is prem tattva. <laughs> So the tattvas are also mixed in with each other as we learn. So how do we learn it? Through the guru and through the scriptures. So one should not be discouraged. There's, it's not like, oh, if I don't become an expert in all the tattvas, I can't become Krishna conscious. It doesn't say that anywhere. One should find interest in learning these tattvas because they're... Uh, they're uh, sources of enlightenment, and they're also sources of spiritual happiness, knowing this knowledge. This knowledge is not only, it awakens bhakti, but it also gives transcendental pleasure. So yeah, of course, what the, the, the material we have at our disposal, given to us by Srila Prabhupada, just by Prabhupada alone, we could never learn even in many lifetimes, there's so much material. And just to learn it is not so easy. But why not make it a life's adventure? It's, I mean, we sometimes we go to school and we want to study a particular subject and we put a lot of time and energy in learning that subject. Do the same thing with Krishna. Learn about Krishna. Krishna is far out. <laughs> He's the coolest guy on the block. <laughs> he's he's got it together. So Yeah. Why not try to learn more and more about Krishna? It's interesting, enlightening and purifying. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mark.
Maharaj, for the lecture. Uh, uh, this, uh, when you were calling this professor, uh, I mean, uh, uh, did he follow uh, any other spiritual authority, or uh, you, you, you made some, you investigated something about his background, or you just uh, no. dialed? The I just found who he, who he, just found his name, and he was a professor at the University of Georgia in Atlanta, Georgia. That's as much as I knew about him. I just wanted to somehow or rather say that you've done certain wonderful work, but you missed the main point. <laughs> that was my reason. And if you put Krishna in there, then the whole thing is even more glorious. Because from a literary point of view, it was quite beautifully done. But it missed that one, that main thing, that Krishna is the Supreme Lord. But I mean, Bhagavad Gita was taken as, uh, as uh, from aesthetic point of view, as literature. What kind of treatise? What was this? What what was or or or, or what was it? A philosophy or uh, I mean, yeah, what, flowery. It was a lot of flowery language. Most very well, very literarily composed nicely with a lot of poetry. Taking the verses of the Gita and expanding it into a more of like a prose type of presentation, make it into a article you could read. <coughs> it was nicely done, <coughs> but it missed the main point. It's like having a garden with no roses. <laughs> He should at least listen something. Or... Mm, no, he he was polite. He said, "Oh, yes, Hare Krishna. Oh, thank <laughs> you, thank you for." Because in other words, he knew about who Hare Krishna is, and you know, we were also seen as fanatics. You know, we don't talk, we don't hear anything else but that Krishna is God. That's all. <laughs> they say if you're a fanatic for the right thing, it's good. <laughs> Nothing wrong with being a fanatic if you're right. <laughs> so yeah, that was back in the nineteen. That that year was nineteen eighty, eighty eight or eighty nine. Nineteen eighty nine, I think it was. So that was eighty nine, ninety nine, thirty, thirty two, thirty thirty two years ago. So since then, our movement has, you know, has grown and become more acceptable in the world before we weren't seen like that in the early days. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Do we have any questions from the from the devotees on the outside there? Mm -hmm. No? Nothing come from the outside? Okay. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Krishna says in the verse, Buddha Bhavana, uh, he is like a, a shelter, resting place of all the living beings. Can you say something more about this? It sounds kind of uh, cozy. <laughs> nice. So, sounds what? Sounds nice, cozy. I mean, the, resting place of all living beings. Yeah, yeah something like <laughs> uh, because he's not. If we do not take shelter in a proper way, maybe or or uh, yeah, 
Atma means also at the time of annihilation when all the living beings go back into the body of Mahavishnu, they rest <laughs> until the next millennium and they come out. So he's the source. <laughs> he's that resting place. <laughs> Okay, should we stop here? Mm -hmm. Okay, I think the curtains are going to close in two minutes. So thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.